we have actually done the passage that we're going to do tonight is in your bulletin so we can look at it together you will want to turn to it in your bible and there will be other passages i will go to that you will want your bible for but we took the first part of it and we worked with now this is just before we read it because we are going to read it together we worked with the unity and the fact that we are uh when when christ came incarnate how there was a a change in terms of the Trinity, because now a member of the Trinity happens to be also a human being, and that that was a permanent situation. When his body was raised, it was a human being body raised, spirit and body raised. And so um, there was a change. And then when the Holy Spirit poured out, it was poured out at Pentecost, there was another change, because now the fellowship that we're invited into is the fellowship of the Trinity. And to deny that the body is one is not to understand the nature of the Trinity. I know we look like that we have all kinds of little pockets and the church is very divided. The church isn't divided. There's one spirit that's been poured out to everyone who's born again. And everyone born again belongs to that one church. There are no divisions in that because there's no divisions in the Godhead. And so the Godhead itself, we've been invited into their fellowship. The love with which they hold that created the earth and gave the earth to the man that he created, that love pulls us back into it to fellowship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when we're praying, we're agreeing with them, him. How else do you say that? All right. And we took that apart in that first part. And then we went on down through and we had uh, more and I mentioned on the fivefold ministries and I, I didn't know whether we would go to the end of this section or what we would do. And I sat down on a Monday and just simply read it through. And I, I, I began to see where we were to go. We're to take this whole passage again. Because the whole passage has a singular point, though it has lots of little goodies in it. Like the little goody about the unity of the spirit. That's a little goody that's not understood. That's a little goody. That's wonderful. But there's a whole, the spirit has an entire point with every little piece of this passage. And we're going to look at it and see what the spirit rose up in me and those of you in the institute will recognize some of the pieces parts and those who've heard me a number of times will will understand some of the pieces parts but we we really have um a journey ahead of us so let's i want us to read it together so that's why you have this passage so uh we can all read the same english standard uh version and um i chose it simply because i'm reading english standard in my daily reading and as i compared the Greek in this passage, the English standard is, is a very nice rendering of it. So we'll just, we'll just work with that, and you compare it with yours as we go through. All right, let's begin. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who ascended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ 
until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. That, not, that last paragraph is a, a conclusion of what the others are saying, but I want us to take it piece by piece as we look at it. Now, this first part, um, a prisoner of the Lord, we, we talked about that, how that Paul never blamed, the, he, he said bluntly that the Jews had, had done what he had done, but as he works with his letters, he calls himself a prisoner of the Lord, uh, reckoning that his circumstances are, have been done by the Lord. In other words, the th bad things people have done to him have been because God allowed. He's not their prisoner. He's not Rome's prisoner. He's Christ's prisoner. All right. Now then, he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And that is the name of our, our lesson tonight, uh, walk worthy of the calling. And we always, in some translations, work with worthily. Um, we always, at least I do, I read this and I go, oh man, who could do that? Uh, whatever calling it is we have of God, it's way beyond my worthy ability. And I, I suggest to you, as the Lord suggested to me in that response, if you'll read on, you'll know it's provided. It's not about your being worthy, it's about your worthy of walking the call. And that's done in Christ. All right? So don't... <laughs> the American church is known as the church that um, is, has an idol. It's called me. And that comes out in many forms. It comes out in me, myself, and I. It comes out in me and my family it comes out in me and my and you just name it me and my denomination me and my local church me and my teaching ministry you understand what I'm talking about it just interprets every we interpret everything and if it doesn't if it doesn't apply to me directly it has no value I cannot tell you how many people I talk to about reading the scriptures and they don't want to because they don't understand it. The reason we don't understand it is because we don't read it. Don't read it. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not willing to get out of our belly button far enough to see how God thinks. You see, the word is about me, but it's not primarily about me. It's a love letter from my Lord that tells me about him. And when I read it, I began to think outside of myself beyond him. And the American church has gone, as we say in the South, hog wild and pig crazy, <laughs> after personal application. And even though there is always a personal application, that's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage is, let me show you things from another point of view. Let me get you out of yourself far enough to see that your father loves you and loves the whole world. And if you allow him, he will show you realms of glory in your spirit and in your heart and eventually in your thinking that you didn't even know existed and that you're a part of. But if we don't read the word, we don't know what to even see. And if we saw something, it would scare us so bad, we wouldn't open the book again <laughs> because we didn't know it was there. All right, enough. 
He says to do this, verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And we worked with that last verse, eager to maintain or preserving. You can't maintain something that's not already given. That's why I say we have unity. It's a matter of spirit. It's not a matter of mind. We have been made one. But I want you to go back, verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another. The idea is to put up with each other. That's, that's in one translation I looked at. Put up with each other. <laughs> Be lenient with one another is another one. I'm going, oh, wow. But notice, all humility and gentleness with patience, knowing that you're one, in the bond of peace in the spirit. Now, that's the way this is walked. You walked worthy in all humility and gentleness and patience, putting up with one another in love. Now, then it goes on and gives us seven ones, all of which, those in the institute, if you have seven, what do you have? That was weak. If you have seven, what do you have? One. One. Thank you. You want to know what that's all about? Come to class. <laughs> Verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. But grace, favor, charis, was given to each one of us according to the measure of my need? No, of what? Christ's gift. Now just turn back a page and look at Ephesians 1, verse 7. That's not it. Which verse is it? Hang on a minute. There it is, number eight, but let's go to seven. In him we have redemption through his blood, speaking of our Jesus, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, woe, which he lavished is the word. Lavished, I think NIV also used it. It's the first one that did use it there. Lavished. Lavished is over the top, right? Which he lavished, and it's not upon, it's into us. The literal is into us. He lavished into us grace. Lavished over the, over the top. I'm going to have to do that visual again one of these times. But just, just so you understand, that's the measure of Christ's gift. It's lavished on you. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led, host a, a, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And the word men is Anthropoi, which means men and women, humanity. It's not specifically male. All right. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. The lower regions of the earth are where we walk. Now, we usually, when we talk about where is hell, we talk about down there. And where is heaven, we talk about up there. But the reality of it is there's nothing down there but hot rock. That's not the abode. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? And when we talk about heaven, heaven is, is <laughs> woo! it's in the same mm, space we are. It's just in a different dimension. Mm. Okay. Now, that may intrigue you, and that's good, too. <laughs> but it's just talking about the one who ascended is the one who came down. That's all this is. It's not some super thing uh, going with First Peter. Um, and I won't even go there, but those of you who have usually connected it with First Peter know. This, this is not that. This is he came down. The one who ate, went up is the one that came down. The one that was incarnate came down to earth. He is the one that went back up. All right, that's what it's saying. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God to mature 
manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, before we go any further, he started out by saying, walk worthy to the way you've been called. In all humility. And now he says he gave, some translations say some to be. This one is, is quite literal. He gave apostles, prophets. He first says, walk in humility. We might want to go to Philippians 2 where it says that Christ, even though he was in the form of God, didn't think it was anything to be held on to by force, but he emptied himself and he humbled himself and became in the form of a man. And then you go further and then it says he humbled himself to the cross. He humbled himself to become like us and then he humbled himself to do what he had to do. The action was humility. But I want us and I, I felt led that we should go to John 13, a very familiar passage. We'll be back. You'll want to mark your, or you're probably using the one given to you. John 13, and I won't read the entire episode, just parts of it, because you know it very well. <coughs> okay. It came over here, but it didn't come over there. Lisa, did that one go off? Did it go off? It's there, but it won't recognize. So you'll have to look over here. My apologies. Can everybody see over there? If you can't, there's room over here to work. All right. Joe will try to, try to get it. It's, I've got some time, so if you'll just work with it. In John 13, now before the feast of the Passover, this is the last Passover that Jesus is going to participate in prior to his death. When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, to the Father, having loved them, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose for supper. Now, I don't want to just slide over that. If you're looking in your own Bibles, notice that Jesus knew three things. Joseph, Jesus didn't do what he is about to do to his disciples because he was the son of God. We excuse a lot of things he did. Well, I shouldn't be expected to do that because I'm not Jesus. Jesus lives inside of you through the Holy Spirit. But please notice the three things he knew. Number one, verse three, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands, Number two, that he had come from God. And number three, he was going to God. That's his identity. His identity was not, I wonder what they're going to think about me. His identity was, he had come from God, he, had, he was going to God, and he had all authority. This was prior to the cross. He knew who he was in God, not a self-esteem, but a God-esteem. Therefore, he could do what he was called to do in a thing called humility. All right. He rose from supper. He laid aside his garments and taking a towel, tied it to his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And then he came to Peter, and you know all that he did there. Verse 12. When he had finished their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you, should, you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. All right. Now, we have been told, with that in your head, I'm going back to Ephesians. We have been told that to walk our walk worthy according to the calling that we have been called in with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing one another with love. It's the action of washing feet. Putting up with one another is the action of washing feet. All right. Now then, the world's way, this makes it a little easier with my pointer, if I can get to it. The world's way is a triangle. This is the way the world thinks. The boss is at the top. Isn't that right? The boss is at the top of the triangle. And he's the most important person around, or she is. Of all the people in the room, the boss is the important one. And you know all about, you know, putting butter on the bread and sitting by the boss and becoming the boss's best friend. And you, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? All right. And you get there by competition. Now, let me just say it flat. Competition is demonic. That's really hard on me because I love Syracuse ball. <laughs> and I have to really pray for those umpires <laughs> and, the, you know, those guys that determine things. I'm a very competitive person in my natural person. And not to join that. You understand what I'm saying? Not to take sides. Not to be competitive. In the world, competition's the way you do it. The early bird gets the worm. You be the best, and you get the top notch and the big paycheck. Isn't that the way it works? It, it is, isn't it? It's the way it works. All right. Uh, there you also got, he's above others and probably stepped on others to get where he is. I mean, everything is good in love and war, right? And corporate work and the church. Oh, dear. <laughs> and then there's the me first attitude. That is, you put your best face first. You make sure people know who you are and what you do and that you're good at it. And... Of course, the least important people are at the bottom. And you really don't care about making friends with them. It's the boss or the vice president you want to make a friend with. And, you, you, you know, in, in the pastor, you want to make, make best friends with the pastor. And if not the pastor, then the elders. And if not the elders, at least the board. And if not the board, then the worship leaders. You understand what I'm talking about. Because we know that favor comes down from the top. This is the world's way. And this way has seeped in, is so a part of us that it is very hard for us to understand that the kingdom of God does not work this way. There are many churches that do because they don't know what we're seeing. And we bless them in Jesus' name. But part of the reason for seeing this passage and understanding this passage is to make certain that we are not in the group that understand this, that we are working with kingdom minds. Whether it's a small fellowship or a large fellowship, we're working in a kingdom mind. And kingdom mind is in a theocracy. It's underneath Almighty God. It's not first of all an American. It's second or third or fourth an American pick us up and put us anywhere in the world, we're still in the same kingdom. We're still operating on this same humility principle. All right. Now, in the Godhead, well, in, in, in our world, we have rank 
and authority. And most of the time, rank and authority go together. By rank, I mean who's the most important, who's the top dog, who's the one at the top calling the shots. And they usually are the ones in authority. They have the authority to open doors or do things. Okay. Now, in the, in the military, we have rank and we have authority. And in the military, you better have rank and authority. All right, doesn't work otherwise. And we think in the church there's rank and there's authority. And if you have a high rank, you must be really close with God. <laughs> and you must have all kinds of authority. And usually they go hand in hand. In the kingdom of God, there's no rank. Now what I mean by that is this. Often we have a couple of families here with babies. I'm going to use the Resignos because they're usually here. And they have Lucas. How old is Lucas? Three? Four? And he's a little one that's so cute that runs around. And now they have little Jude. <laughs> and he's just a couple of months. Now, in Jesus, that four-year-old Lucas... When he prays at night, God hears his prayer just as quickly as he hears yours. And he may well grant it prior to yours. <laughs> Though we may have labored and slaved and, and done everything in God, we know we read our Bible, we prayed for an hour, we even tucked 15 minutes and tongues in there. You know, we did all of that kind of stuff. And we should really be honored by God. And lo and behold, here comes a four-year-old Jesus. Because there's no rank. It doesn't make any difference what your calling is, what your dimension of service is called to be. You don't have any rank. He's the king. He's the king. However, and I, let, me, let me say this. In the Godhead, you don't have rank either. I know we teach it. First person's the Father, second person's the Son, third person's the Holy Spirit. You won't find that in this book. You find Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three in one. There's no rank. There's not one important and the other one not. They belong together. You don't have one without the other. Does does. Does God mind if you pray to Jesus? If you pray to Jesus, you pray to God. Does he mind if you just say, Holy Spirit, he doesn't care? I don't know how many times I've answered those questions. He doesn't care as long as you talk to him. You call me mama, mother, mom, I'm good. You say ma, I may not answer. <laughs> My children know that. I happen to be southern. Ma doesn't cut it. So... All of that to say, there's, there's, just, there, there's, there's just no rank in the Godhead. They, they are perfectly enjoined together. Now, I wish I could get one that, that twirled and, and all that, but that would be this track, so I decided that wouldn't, that wouldn't be needed. Now, when it comes to authority, however, we have authority in the kingdom. And let's just take the Godhead to see it, because in the Godhead, we... Whoops. It did it. We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we have an authority line. Not an importance line. Not one over the other. But there is an authority line. And that authority line is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, us. And it goes back up the same way. What happened? Oh, it went backwards. Well, I hit the wrong one. I'm learning. It went down. And now we go up. There we go. And so there is an authority line. Just like in Psalm 19. There's not one important over another. I'm no more important than anybody else here before God. There's an authority line in the ministry. And I happen to know the buck stops here. I didn't volunteer for this. <laughs> it was a calling. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> But, you, you know, Psalm 19 was not my idea. You, you need to know that. This was two older sisters of mine. One's in the Lord and, and the other one's Mary Egan. 
And they called me and told me I was going to do it. I am? Oh, my. Okay. With Joe's permission, I started. But I remind the Lord often, I did not volunteer for this. And I did not invent this. And that's a great comfort in my heart when things are pressured and tight. Lord, this is your idea, not mine. How well I know that. All right. But there is an authority line in any organization. There's an authority line in the church. There's an authority line in the local church. There's an authority line in the area. There's author authority line in each ecclesiastical, or ecclesiastical organization. There's an authority line. And we are taught in the word of God to submit to that authority line. But it's not a rank. And our minds need to understand, and, and I think what we're going to look at in a minute will help us understand, because if we're not careful, this turns into that pyramid. And that's not what it is. That's not what the kingdom is. All right. God's kingdom way has an upside-down triangle. Now, you'll notice that our Lord Jesus is at the bottom. That's because he's not only Savior and Redeemer. He's our intercessor. He's the one that upholds the world by his word of power, Hebrews 1. I think it's verse 4. He is the one who heals us. He is the one who gives us our daily bread. He is the one who comforts us through the Holy Spirit. He is the one who gives us everything that we have for life and godliness. Jesus is our support. We could put Holy Spirit and Father down there if we wanted to, but Jesus came as a servant and he still is one. If Jesus doesn't empower it, it's not empowered in the Spirit. He happens to be the one who has the power of attorney in heaven right now. God gave him the power of attorney. Now, when he sat down at the right hand, Jesus was occupying the place of the son that inherits it all. And the father sits back and lets him. He is the king. Now then, there'll come a time when he'll hand the kingdom back to his father. 1 Corinthians 15. But that's not yet. So he's at the bottom. The boss, the king, is at the bottom in a support role. All right. Now then. When we come to Jesus. We come from everywhere. Yeah, we are. We all look alike, don't we? I think that's all of us. <laughs> Didn't count a crawl. I was talking. When we come to Jesus, we are the important ones. This is the level of importance. If one is important over another, it is the ones who come to Jesus that are the important ones. They're at the top. They're at the top. <laughs> and uh, when they get the Holy Spirit, they get all of him. Oh, you're quiet. Oh, yeah, I'm Pentecostal, but hang on. When the Spirit comes in, his person comes in. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit sets up a tea party inside. And he say, he'll come and sup with you. In my case, it'd be a cup of coffee. He's hard to come by in me. But you understand what he's done. He says, don't you know you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? Where does God live? Any four-year-old can tell you. In my heart. In my heart. He lives in my heart. Yes, he does. Yes, he fills the earth, but he lives in my heart. He's taken up residence within us. And so he brings all that he is. He didn't bring just a little part of him. He brought all that he is. Now with us, if, if I take all that I am and I put me here at the Psalm 19 building, that means I'm not at home down the street, up the street. I mean, I'm ho at home here, but you understand. 
I'm only in one spot. But God, who is spirit, is everywhere. So him being all that he is in me is no limitation to him being all he is everywhere he is. And my thing is, he didn't take off his finger and put a little part of him in each of us. Sometimes I think he, we think that way. He just put a little bit of something in me that calls me home. When you accepted Christ, he put himself in you. Now then, everything is in you. But when you hear the call and you know that you need all that he is to live out the life that he's called you to live, that we're going to get into in the 17th verse and following, to have that life, you know you need all all of him and he expresses himself in nine power gifts first corinthians 12 and in what we might call the more ordinary gifts in romans 12 he expresses himself in giftedness that is supernatural and you don't get one you get them all then he's free to call on whoever and whenever and whatever he wants when now listen to me. They work in clusters. They don't work by themselves. When Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus, it was in our daily reading today, and he came to the tomb and he says, Lazarus! And we all breathe a sigh of relief that he didn't just say, come out. Because everybody in that graveyard would have had to... He said, Lazarus, he made it very specific, Lazarus, come out. And the next thing we know is that Lazarus is standing there all wrapped up in his grave clothes, right? There are at least three major supernatural gifts that Jesus used to do that. What are they? Faith, healing, and miracles, at the very least. To raise someone from the dead is a miracle, correct? To have faith to do any of it is giftedness and to perform healings you don't want to raise him and have him be sick <laughs> so at least three were cooperative and, and i think if we dig we'll probably there was prophetic before when he visited with mary there are other gifts in and out usually when prophecy comes forth it is prophecy and words of wisdom and words of knowledge all rolled into one when you know those elements and you study those gifts and you figure out what they are they're all rolled into one it's called prophecy so they don't work by themselves. They work in clusters. Just like the, 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 the uh, Trinity is a, a networking. It is three in one. Everything that is of God works together. So the giftings work together. So everybody has them. Everybody can learn to use them. He says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, pursue spiritual, earnestly desire, lust after what the Greek would say lust after spiritual gifts in other words really want them bad because they are the avenue through which God speaks and if you look at all of them not just the nine power one but all of them all the way back to Romans 12 when you include teaching and you include administration and you include giving and you include helps and you include all kinds of things in that mix they're not just the nine power ones. They're all kinds of things that allow the movement of God's people in supernatural ways. All right. Now then, as we work together, loving one another in this supernatural walk that we have, what happens is there's another dimension that we find developing. And these are some of the others that are, but not everybody. Okay. Those are folk that have worked in a local scene, whether it's a local church or local Bible class or local whatever they've worked in a local scene and they have what we would call a ministry within certain elements of that gift these are and and we just because i'm a teacher i'll just pull that out because teaching 
First, a person might be teaching a Sunday school class, and then uh, I'm thinking about my many, many years in children's classes. Started when I was very young at 15 and started teaching children Bible. And um, eventually, as people mature and go on, they began to teach in a wider sphere within their local scene. And this is the ad. This is what's being addressed in First Corinthians 12, the latter part. Are all this, are all prophets, are all this, are all teachers? No. Everyone, everyone here teaches. Now let me explain. If you talk to anybody about Jesus, you teach. You understand what I'm saying? If you can share a testimony, you're teaching. You may not be teaching in a ministry of teaching, but you're teaching. Everybody sharing is teaching. Everybody teaches. Everybody does everything on some level. However, then there are those within a local scene that you'll notice the ones who speak in tongues in a local church, they're usually always the same ones. That means somebody else couldn't. It's just they have a ministry within that. Same thing about the prophetic. It'll be the same ones. Why? Can anybody else? Oh, yeah, they can all prophesy. However, there are some who have been pulled out that will do that more than others. They're on a level of ministry. They're on a level of calling. What direction have they gone in the body of Christ? Say it louder. Down, not up. I can remember years ago, good 15, almost 20 years ago, I was having my daily devotionals, and I felt the Lord beginning to call me to a particular placement. And I literally hit the floor with a guttural, no, nothing in me wanted that. And I said, I don't want to go that low. Because what we're talking about is washing feet. It looks like the world's triangle. It isn't. It's the opposite way. It's going down. And it's not that we should not give honor. You remember last time we were together, uh, um, Clay Glickert was here. He spoke a word to the church, the congregation. My pastor was here. My associate pastor was here. And they spoke to all and encouraged. And we give honor to where honor is due. But they're not at the top. They're down. We don't honor them because they're at the top. We honor them because of their work and the work of their heart, which is down. It's the basin of water and the towel. It's involved in people's lives. It's carrying people's hearts. Now, when it says here, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, verse 11, the evangelists, the shepherds, most translations say pastors. That's the word that is translated shepherds all the way through the Bible. But in this place, most people put pastor. It's the only place it's translated pastor. It's always translated shepherd. And I appreciate this. Shepherds and teachers. These are people with these gifts. It's not speaking of gifts except as people. All of these are people. All are people. The gifts remain the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But there is a placement, and there are a lot of placements within this that would be on a local scene or on a semi, and you could even say there's another dimension on a local scene where you might have um, one, say, uh, you have a senior pastor, or you might have associate pastor, you might have worship leaders, would be even maybe down a, a little bit further supporting all the team. But I chose to leave all of those on the more or less local scene on that because we could go down dimensions depending upon how our particular ecclesiastical church was organized. All right? But there is another dimension. 
And this dimension is what he's talking about here. We call it the fivefold. It is the prophet. It is the, the I'm sorry, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. These are not necessarily local. They're called the fivefold. Some of the characteristics of operating in a fivefold is usually they found something. I mean, they, they start something. You, that is a characteristic of an apostle as well. They also usually have people under them doing the same thing. In other words, an evangelist in the fivefold would be an evangelist training evangelists, having evangelists under them serve. Uh, all pastors, shepherds, teachers are not fivefold. In order to be fivefold, there must be a training by which that is recognized. And so you work with this is a level that we have not in the kingdom uh, seen rise to the forefront. Those of you that were at Dr. Carolyn's um, conference, the last time we had a conference, um, her first presentation was on the fact that e in, in a very short period of time, the church is going to begin to be literally run by the fivefold. It is going to, it, it is going to be that which the, the, the systems we now know will not endure too long. But the fivefold will come in and be it. And there are a lot of pieces, parts to that that I've learned since then. But, and that's not to put down our curtain current networks. It's just to say that the Lord has a movement on the, on the horizon that will be vastly different than anything we've ever known. And the fivefold ministry will be active in it. I do believe there are apostles today. They are not the apostles that wrote the Bible. But there are people that serve as apostles. If you cling to there were only 12 apostles, can't be any more. Well, maybe 13 with Paul. If you're going to be biblical, there are at least 16 people called apostles in the New Testament. One of them was a woman. That's a little startling when we find that out. That's Romans 16, verse 7. But the whole idea of people becoming those gifts and working in harmony together. But I wanted not so much to go into that area as to understand that each dimension, and it's not a level, each dimension of calling is a walk of humility or it's not a worthy walk. You know the whole idea, yes, I'm coming out on top. That's an emotion that goes with the world. It's not an emotion that goes with service in the kingdom. Lord, I've got some more dirty water I need to dump. Lord, another person came through the door. When you recognize that every person is important, every child, super important, that playing favorites, being partial, is not the way the kingdom works that no one's more important than anyone else. I often say in Psalm 19, I don't have any positions. I just have jobs. <laughs> People want to come and work. We got places. But you understand what I'm saying. There's, there's no position. In operating in giftedness, any with position, any with placement, is called to live it the way he lived it, washing their feet, washing the people's feet. Didn't mean he didn't have full authority. He did knowing he had full authority, gave him the ability to wash their feet. Gave the ability. Now then, the neat thing about this is because Jesus lives inside of us. Then he's empowered through his giftedness and his people to literally come out through them, to them. Now, your relationship with your Lord will encourage you. We need to learn to be encouraged with our relationship with the Lord. But we also need to understand that the primary way of encouragement is fellowship. 
And as we fellowship with one another, we are encouraged. One of my encouragers is here tonight for the first time. Debbie's back there at the back. I get, an, I get a text from Debbie every week that tells me she loves me. She's praying for me. She happens to go to my church. She blesses me very much. Just bless her, bless her, bless her. Why, she just, there, there's just a value in encouraging. Encouraging for no reason at all. Just encourage one another. Because you see, from the middle of our core, where Jesus lives, he says, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And then he goes further toward the end. It says, when he says, when we grow up to maturity, these things are in place so we can grow up to maturity, to the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftedness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him. I love that. Not unto him, into him, who is the head into Christ. So our journey is into him at the very bottom. And our joy is watching him come at us and encourage others. That's our job. Whatever it is we do, it's our job to make sure others know they are up here. They're the super important ones. Oh, glory. Hmm. From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Makes the body grow so it constructs itself in love. Wouldn't it be? And won't it be? Because I'm going to speak it positively. Won't it be wonderful when people think about the church of the beloved Lord, about the fellowship of the Lord, those on the outside looking in, be drawn by the fact there's love there, there's unconditional love there, there's support there, there's inclusion there. Whether you understand these crazy people or not, they'll love you to death. They'll get out the basin of water and wash your feet. Remember the words we sang, he is here to break, to, to heal the brokenhearted and lift every burden that might be. And that's our job. We can do that. We not not be able to make a whole check and help somebody with their finances like that, but we can sure encourage them that God's going to help them and things are going to be good and that it's not all doom and gloom. And so what if we fall off the financial cliff? which probably doesn't exist to start with. Because we love. That's what it means to walk worthy of the calling. You love one another in Jesus. You just bless one another. You let Jesus come out of his core inside of you and be a blessing to each and every one. That's the call. That's the walk worthy. <laughs> That's the calling. And everybody got that call. If you're at the top, you got the call. So get busy among the, the ones there. And if he's given you a placement somehow to, to be with others, do the same there. I don't have to be one that has to be carefully kept. You know the ones that have to be carefully kept? You have to make sure you talk to them or they get offended. Or you have to make sure they're not slighted because they get offended. Or you have to make sure of this or make sure. Don't be a carefully kept person in Jesus. Be a reckless lover in him. That's what he's been with us. I am amazed he trusts you. <laughs> and you're amazed he trusts me. Well, what, what if I do it wrong? You will. I have. Blown it big. Come and lay down every burden. He's here. 
Amen. Amen. Does our worship team have a, another song? Lord, I just praise you for your word. I praise you that you allow us the freedom and the joy to experience you and to see and to feel and to know. Lord, I know all your lessons are really very simple. You're here, and you call us to get the basin of water and a towel and begin washing feet. So, Lord, we do need your help here because we so want to stand up and be counted. <laughs> Every one of us, Lord, want to be noticed. And may we be aware of that as we notice people and love people. And may we enjoy you so much that discouragement would be the furthest thing from our hearts. That we would just encourage, encourage and bless. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus and everyone said, Amen. Amen.